Thank you all so much. I'm now going to turn it over to Yafa to start off our learning together. Thank you so much, Haley, and um, thank you for that update from uh, Yerushalayim. It's wonderful to feel connected, and what a beautiful um, initiative um, from Pardes. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Um, it's really beautiful to be with you all. It's always so wonderful to be with the Pardes community, and there's so many faces, and even if we can't see your faces, your names. Um, it's such an honor to be with you all, so many beloved friends and colleagues and mentors and just our community. It's very special to be the Pernice community right now. Um, I wanted to just share a little Torah that is sort of a window into what I am thinking about and what really it's sort of the Torah that has sustained me for the last few weeks. Um, I offer it very humbly because in truth, there's really nothing right to say right now and yet we have to we have to we have to learn Torah and we have to speak and we have to come together in community so please do I offer very humbly and I'm thinking about all of our parties um family and their children and wishing them all safety I want to mention particularly my nephews and niece who are um in the army right now and um working hard to protect the Jewish people. And I wanted to start, you'll see here on the page with uh, the Achenu prayer. We won't sing it because it's Zoom and it's hard to do singing, but we'll just read it. Achenu kol Yisrael, hanetunim b'tzara u'veshivya, ha'omdim b'in b'yam u'bin b'yam asha, ha'makom y'rachem aleyem, v'yotzi'e mitzara l'revacha u'mafela le'ora, u'mishiabud l'geula, hashta b'agala v'zman kari v'nomar amen. Um, we're thinking about all those in captivity who need freedom um, immediately. Um, so uh, one of the things I think I'm hearing a lot um, and from people that I love and, you know, constituents, students and fellow leaders um, and teachers is we don't know how to respond. And there is a feeling in the world that there is supposed to be a right response. I'm supposed to know exactly how to respond to this crisis. I'm supposed to know how to write the right Facebook post that makes this, shows that I'm on the right side of history and shows that I'm the right way, I have the right moral compass, or I'm supposed to do something in my community that proves that I know what to do. And one of the things I've been trying to say and trying to, encourage myself to feel is there is no right response right now at this moment. There's many, many correct responses. There's many real responses. Some of us are activists and some of us are prayer people and some of us are friars and some of us are all those things. And on Monday, I'm one thing and two hours later, I'm another thing. And that is all real and okay and is normal when you are in mourning and when you are in shock and when you are trying to bring about a better world. That is all normal. And as always, Torah is our comfort and teaches us this and teaches us that there's more than one way to respond to terrible tragedy, to communal loss. So I wanted to present sort of three responses and they're just three we could have another three that would be in their place and there's tens more and there, again there's just many responses but these are the three that I've been thinking about and <clears throat> focusing on for myself so I wanted to share them with you and of course to hear your perspectives as well I wanted to start off with um one of the most famous moments of terrible tragedy that happens in the Torah which is when Aaron, the high priest, Aaron Cohen, when his sons, he has two sons who die. And this is on, this is source number two. Can you all see? Everyone can see this text? Okay, yeah, okay, phenomenal. So <clears throat> in source number two, I'm just gonna read it and I'll have someone read the next source um, in the interest of time. Um, 
Now Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, each took his fire pan, put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and they offered before the Lord a strange fire, right? Um, Eish Zara, the text tells us, which God had not commanded them, and fire came forth from the Lord and consumed them. Thus they died at the instance of the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when God said, through those near to me, I show myself holy and gain glory before all the people. Vaidom Aharon. And Aaron was silent. Okay? And I just want to ask you, <clears throat> take one more minute, maybe if you want to read it to yourselves. <clears throat> but I just want to ask you about the silence. So Aaron has just experienced perhaps one of the most devastating losses possible for a human being, which is a loss of a child. And not only one child, but two children. And Moses speaks to him. And Aaron's response is silence. And I just want to ask you about this. You please, I'm going to ask you actually to put it in the chat, if you will. Just, just tell me, why do you think, what is Aaron's silence about? Shock. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Right. It's it, that's, sometimes our first response to terrible tragedy is shock. What else, my friends? Dumbfounded, devastated, so he can't speak. Fear, sadness, reflection. There are no words. The loss is so overpowering. They're not. They're not words that. Uh, that we can say. Thank you, Mark. Mm, maybe he's angry and he's trying to hold himself back. That's what we're seeing some anger. Beautiful. <laughs> that was a four in a row of anger, right? It's an interesting, our first response is, oh, it's shock. And then we let ourselves be like, oh no, there's anger here, right? And in, and in particular, right? <clears throat> in particular, it seems like, and of course, this could be its own sheer and its own course, and right? But in particular, it seems like the motivations of the children are good. And what does it mean? So the anger, of course, is, right? Maybe there's humility. Maybe there's incapacity. Beautiful. And then Enid, I don't know if Enid or Enid, I'm sorry. If I'm pronouncing your name correctly. says something here that I think is very, very important to notice. I want us to see this. Because the, the comment here is, what? What is Moshe's response here? We're focusing on Aaron's silence, which perhaps feels natural to us, but like, what is Moshe saying? Moshe's response is, oh, this is what God meant when God said, those near to me, I show myself holy and gain glory before the people, right? Um, wh what does it mean that Moshe would say such a thing to Aaron? And uh, perhaps Aaron's response, what's interesting here is, perhaps Aaron's response of silence is to Moshe's comment, and perhaps it's to the tragedy. It's actually not clear what happens between the loss and Moshe's commentary, or Moshe's comment, I should say. And maybe Moshe comes to comfort, and Aaron's response to Moshe's comfort is just silence. It's not actually to the tragedy necessarily, but it's like, what? What are you saying? I just had the worst loss. You're trying to comfort me. First of all, I don't love, like the comfort that you're comforting me. And second of all, <clears throat> maybe, Maybe, why are you even trying to comfort me at all? Maybe that actually your response at all, and I'll tell you, I recently taught this text because this is the Torah that I'm teaching right now, my friends, and a, a wonderful participant said that sometimes, oh, Rebecca, we're literally going right there. You are amazing. Um, um, sometimes when someone tries to offer an explanation, when I'm feeling grief, I actually, my grief gets shut down, right? That maybe there was a shutting down. No, no, don't be sad, Aaron. This is from God. And Aaron's response is, what? I, what are you talking about? I, I have to respond. And there's a silencing, actually, perhaps, that happens um, to Aaron from, from Moshe's attempt to give a response. So the amazing Rebecca Barr just said to us, right, that perhaps this is sort of reminiscent to us of, um, this is reminiscent of the, well, at Shiva, right? When we go to a Shiva and there's someone mourning, Actually, the Jewish practice is to not speak until the mourner speaks. So the amazing um, Blue Greenberg, I'm sure many of you know. Uh, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, 
the the amazing Blue Greenberg wrote a beautiful commentary in the in the in the woman's commentary on the Torah about exactly what you're saying, Rebecca. And she wrote it after her own loss of her own son. She had a terrible loss of their of Rabbi Yitz and, and Blue lost their son JJ, young. And she writes about this moment of silence from our own. So um, actually, Rebecca, can I ask you to read this? Do you mind? Since it was your brilliance that brought us here. Okay. Sure, yes. Um, the deepest response of love, Blue Greenberg, the Torah, a women's commentary. What was Aaron's response? Two simple words, Vayidom Aharon, and Aaron was silent. The word Vayidom means more than he kept quiet, Vayishtok. Aaron responded with a profound, shattering silence, a stunning silence, a shocked silence. He does not justify the cruel decree by blaming his sons and accepting their fate as punishment for their sins. Yet, neither does he revolt or protest God's action. Total silence. Aaron's response is the profoundest human and religious response to the reality that there are times when good people die unjustly or are consumed in tragedies that seem to be arbitrary, shocking, without justification, and with nothing to ameliorate the pain and loss of those who love them. At times, devout members of religions that affirm an afterlife are tempted to say that the deceased is in a better place, living a better life in a better world, or they are tempted to suggest that there must be some sin or error or judgment that has brought this fate upon the victim. Such persons cannot tolerate the thought that what has happened is unjustified, for it violates their deepest principles about good and evil, reward and punishment. They need somehow to internally rationalize and justify a reality in order to bring the world back to proper equilibrium. The Jewish laws of bereavement, so exquisitely tuned to the needs of the mourners, stipulate that the Shiva visitor should not speak until the mourner speaks. I had always thought that the point of that precept was to ensure that the conversation would flow to the place the mourner needs it to reach. But now I understand that the halakha, Jewish law, enjoining the comforting visitor to hold back in silence serves a different function to caution against offering a rationale for the decree of death. The deeper human religious response is to be silent, to live with the contradiction, and to affirm that we need not force meaning into tragedy. Sometimes the deepest response of love is to be silent. Thank you so much, Rebecca, beautiful. So Lua here is saying a lot of very important things, but one of the things I think is so very powerful about what she's teaching us here is the idea that actually we have to be able to hold both things, right? I actually, there is no simple way to excuse or justify or explain the tragedy we are, we are beholding. We cannot understand it. And at the same time to still maintain my faith. Right? She is not saying, and therefore I, I let go of my, I relinquish my faith, right? But actually what it means is to live in this place of contradiction, right? Where I don't know why and I still believe. And that's what she calls, right? That's what she calls the response of love, right? And, and that it's so normal and so natural for us to want to understand because it's so hard to hold that there is no reason for what is happening, that it is not justified, right? Um, it's, an, it's interesting, Joel, yes, I understand, right? That, yeah, I know there's so many words, there's so many words. So for some of us, this response is not gonna work. I just wanna be clear. For some of us, we feel that the battlefield right now is Dafka, is specifically in the, in the um, realm of words. That's what some people feel right now, and I want to honor that and respect it. And someone else wrote in the chat, right, that silence is complicity in Judaism, and we don't want to we don't want to be silent. We don't want to be complicit. But I also very much want to honor that for some people, I don't yet have the words, and I'm not going to get involved in that aspect. And we have to honor that that that's okay for some. 
Um, but it doesn't work for everyone. And other people want the response to be words and our writing and our um, writing letters. And of course, of course, people are having different responses to this moment. The next uh, response I wanted to move on to is the idea of tears. Um, and I understand this is a, it's a very raw time. So your tears are welcome here. Um, and maybe mine will come too. But um, hmm. one of the things that's interesting, of course, one major response, and we're seeing it a lot, is prayer. But one of one of our traditions, um, <clears throat> one of our rabbis taught us, this is source number four, that miyom shecharav ve'hamidash, from the day that the temple was destroyed, Ninalu The gates of prayer are locked. Now, my friends, that's such a hard thing to understand theologically. Like we're doing, there's so many beautiful prayer that's happened, so many prayer vigils, and many, many synagogues have added into Helim and added in Psalms. But there's something powerful to me about the idea that when I face such enormous destruction, like the temple's destruction, Rabbi Lazar says. I don't feel like prayer is my answer, okay? Again, this doesn't have to work for all of us. We're all different, okay? But I thought it was uh, important to bring that because some of us, prayer has been our respite right now. For some of us, I can't even open my door. I know people like that, right? I can't even open my door right now. It's not working for me. But what does he say? Yet, despite the fact that the gates of prayer were locked with the destruction of the temple, the gates of tears were not locked. As it is stated, Right? Right? Hear my prayer, give my give ear to my pleading, keep that silent at my tears. So in other words, somehow, somehow tears have the capacity to overpower even locked gates of heaven. That one of the responses to Finding my prayers not answered is to call out in tears, okay? But then, my friends, I wanted to couple this text with this gorgeous piece from Hagiga, just verse number five, which says, you know who else is crying? Not only are we crying, but God is also crying. We're not alone in this path of tears. And here is the source number five. We're told, but, will you, but if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret. Let me stare for your pride. From Shmuel Bar Inya said in the name of Rav, the holy blessed one has a place where God cries and its name is Mistarin, is hiddenness. Let me say, what? God cries? Didn't your papa say there is no sadness before the holy blessed one? And the stated honor and majesty are before God, strength and gladness are in God's place. The Gemara responds, this is not difficult. The statement that God cried is referring to Mistari, the innermost cha chambers, where God can cry in secret. Whereas the statement that God does not cry is referring to the outer chamber. So we have a contradiction, one where God is only in the glory, never in the tears, and one that says God cries the Mistari in the hiddenness. And the Gemara solves it by saying there are two images, really. There are two moments for God. One is a public face, and one is a private face. I just want to hear from you. What do you think it means that God cries in private? What do you think, my friends? What are, you can either raise your hand and unmute yourself, or we'll unmute you, I'm sorry. Or you can put it in the chat. What do you think it means that God cries in mystery? Yes, Leslie. We're going to unmute you. Yeah. Um, I think one aspect of it is that God is not perfect. Mm -hmm. God recognizes the imperfection that he will not show normally to human beings, but has to do that in private. But God acknowledges himself beautiful beautiful so god there's a there's a there's a rabbinic of this there's a rabbinic imagining right that god is imperfect 
but also interestingly doesn't want to show that imperfection to the human and that goes with in the chat we have this comment right um that that god doesn't want to publicly right god's public face needs to be one way which by the way i think is so human right that right exactly right who do i not want to see me cry right so i think I think it's such a powerful idea that there are times either I don't want my children to see me cry. I want them to understand I'm strong. Maybe God also doesn't want God's children to see God cry because God has to be strong for us, maybe, right? But it's also an interesting idea that we also sometimes put on a public, brave face. I have to go to work. I have to do my thing. I have to show, right, I'm strong. I don't want people to see I'm vulnerable. But there's a power also in understanding that there are moments of tears and those are okay and you can sometimes do them publicly and sometimes you don't have to do them publicly they can also be private moments of tears and and just like god does right and that there's something that would actually make us terrified if god was crying in public which is which is really important right mm, beautiful right maybe god is disappointed deeply disappointed in us it's interesting i want to offer one other possibility which is sometimes it feels like god is so hidden and God is not with us. So God is in the Mysterim. But you should know when you don't feel God, perhaps, perhaps the Gemara saying to us, when you don't feel God, just know that God is also with you in the hiddenness. That's where God lives, right? And actually, maybe, right, your tears and God's tears, they're in Chavruta. Your tears don't fall on, on deaf ears, even if we can't see, even if we can't see. We can't see the change right now. So there's something powerful in the hiddenness that might bring us comfort. With my last minute, I want to move on to, and this really, my friends, this is like my deepest terror at the moment. And probably I mean, many of you have heard me teach this already, so I'm sorry, but this is really like what is sustaining me in this moment. So I want to share it with you, and I'd love to hear what you think. This is a very piece of fa famous piece of Talmud, and probably many of you know this from Sota Yodalit, which talks about this idea that in Deuteronomy 13, we are told, Hashem Elokeichem Telechu, after the Lord your God, you shall walk. And the, the Gemara says, fast the Gemara says to us, what? Is it possible for a person to walk after God? Right? Which, by the way, why is that a question? Of course it should be possible for a person to walk after God. But like that's the whole, isn't that the whole religion? We're supposed to be walking after, what's the question that they're asking, right? There's, there's an interesting question there. And then the answer that they give to their question, meaning what is difficult about this walking behind God, is that isn't God, isn't God an ish ochla? Isn't God a consuming fire? Which has always bothered me. Why is that the example that the, Rabbis give. Why don't I say I can't walk after God? God is all good. God is all knowing. God is all powerful. I can't be like God because God is too great. But that's not what actually the Gemara says. I can't be like God because God is a consuming fire. Now, maybe that means too awesome and I'll be swept up in God's uh, power. But I think one of the things I think the Gemara is trying to say is what do I do when I look at a world? And the world is on fire. Everywhere I look, I see ish. I see consuming fire. And there's no way out. I just look around me. I just feel like deep despair about the world, which I don't know about everyone else here, but sometimes this moment feels like that. I don't have anywhere to turn. I look over here. It's on fire. I look over here. Now, I know there's so much beauty happening in Israel right now and so much stuff that people are coming to each other's aid. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes it can feel this way right now what do i do so the gemara then says okay rather walk after god's ways which itself is a problematic answer you just told me that one of god's ways is being destructive so what do you mean so what's the, what is the gemara saying to me the gemara here is saying what that really means is when you look at the divine and you maybe god is hiding or maybe god is you see what's happening in the world as destructive. The world is on fire. Your job is to look at the world, to look at the divine and say, what do I know to be good? I know 
that there are acts of goodness. I know that there are acts of chesed. Just as God clothes the naked, so you clothe the naked. Just as God visits the sick, so you visit the sick. Just as God comforts the mourner, you comfort the mourner. Just as God buries the dead, you bury the dead. We know what is good and right in the world, and we know how to do it. And that perhaps can be one of our responses to this moment. I don't know what to do on a global level, but I know how to take care of my people. I know how to bring more acts of chesed. So may we merit, I know I'm already over, I'm so sorry, Jordan. Um, may we merit to find and honor the responses that are true for us at this moment, to see how our tradition supports us in those moments, and to bring acts of kindness, even when the world is on fire, where we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yafa, for your beautiful and very, very important Torah. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming today. Um, we'll keep this short because I know we're already over. Um, we are going to be meeting. That's OK, Yafa. Um, it was well worth it. Um, we're going to be meeting back here on uh, next Monday, October 30th, for some more Torah with uh, Tzvi Hirschfeld on how can we pray in the face of tragedy. Um, I want to note that for those of you based outside of Israel, this um, the class will be happening at the same time. For those of you who are in Israel, the clocks are changing, so the class will be at 7 p.m. Um, I'm going to now drop in the chat a survey. Um, we would love to know how we can continue to support you and the entire party's community um, in any ways that you might be interested in offering support to others during this time that we can help uh, facilitate. So I dropped the form, I'll drop it again, and, uh, and we'll send it out in an email as well. Thank you again, Yafa, so much. And thank you to all of you. And take care.